We know that there should be a place out there from whence all comets originate. We know this in the same way a dad knows when his kid has done something suboptimal, that is, not necessarily with complete knowledge of the detailed something. Hi, my name's Alex. I've argued enough for a lifetime. If you like to know more about nature, how we find out about it, and how all of this relates back to being kind in our daily lives, please consider subscribing, hitting the bell, and sharing. I can't promise that you'll find answers in single videos, but it's all there in the channel as a whole. On to comets, science, and dads. This is how I understand it all. Until the beginning of the 20th century, people believed comets to visit the solar system exactly once. The comets looked as if they moved on so-called parabolic orbits around the Sun. But already then some people had their doubts. And after a while it became clear that the comets could just as well move on elliptic orbits and therefore stay within the solar system. This also meant that they would have to have their origin within the solar system. The first to put these doubts and their implications into words was the Estonian astronomer Ernst Oepik in the 1930s. A Dutchman called Jan Oort had the same idea as Oepik just in the 1950s, independently. Oort started with these two ideas. 1. Looking at timescales comparable to the lifetime of the solar system as a whole, one finds out soon enough that the comet's orbits are unstable, that is, they are affected by the planet's presence in such a way that they either end up as sun fodder or as outcasts in the wider interstellar space. 2. Every time a comet closes in on the sun, parts of it will be boiled away. There is a lot of water in comets. We know what happens when water gets too warm. If those assumptions were right and everything looked as if they were, then there was supposed to be a sort of reservoir out there, a place these beautiful comets originated from. Measurements and observations were needed, and precise ones too. Once conducted, they showed that many of the comets had their most remote point at roughly the same distance from the Sun, 20,000 times further out than Earth, that is. Placing the reservoir quote-unquote there became an enticing thought. I put the word reservoir in quotes in that last sentence because we know now that it is a little dicey and just not straightforward at all to talk about the origin of the comets. They travel on elliptical orbits and there are similarity to those orbits, mostly that is. For there were of course exceptions. Some comets had their aphelion, as it's called, closer to the Sun, but none further. That meant nothing else than that those comets had already lost some of their speed. Coming close to the Sun meant water boiling away and energy being lost to the comet. So that made sense. Then of course, the Pan-STARRS telescope on Maui found a comet which seemed to arrive from interstellar space. There's a link below. In addition, once in the outer solar system, comets are dark and just about invisible to our telescopes. Thus, we can only infer, but not really prove, the existence of what is called the Epic Oort Cloud. That's how it is. Not only do we have to admit that we can't prove beyond the proverbial shadow of a doubt what we know has to be there, no, we also find what on the surface may be counterexamples in the end. They aren't, but that's a whole different text in itself. And this really reminds me of the conversations I can have with my kids sometimes. I know that it is principally possible for someone else to have taken the chocolate out of the cupboard. It's also perfectly reasonable to think the brown stuff around your mouth and on your fingers is dirt from the garden. But 